Today, I have a return guest. This is Joe Alch. I am the, uh, this is the Acapella Podcast. We are so excited to have Godwin Dixon today. And I have to give a special shout out. Today is our 50th episode on our Acapella Podcast. So what better guest to have than Godwin? Just to give a little um, information and bio on Godwin, he is a career-long senior care leader who I've known and worked for for many years. He's led the Traymore uh, Signature Point on the Lake in the 90s before leading the Presbyterian Senior Care System for 17 years. Um, co coronavirus right now is especially dangerous for seniors. And Godwin, you have become the expert in corona information. His regular Facebook podcast, um, Facebook page updates have been shared again and again. And he's been a trusted source for unbiased, non-political updates on what is going on. And we've heard so much. So let's get the facts. So Godwin, tell us coronavirus was all the news in March. Um, and April, and then May and May before the news changed a little bit. So now it's back in the news. Coronavirus is on the rise. Godwin, will you bring us up to speed on what's going on? So um, thank you, Joe. And, you know, it's an honor to be on the 50th. 50th that's great. These are great podcasts. I always enjoy them. And I'm always happy to share. Uh, working in senior care, we have had to take this virus very, very serious because we recognize the risk that it provides to our seniors. And so I have been a part of the uh, regular calls with the Texas Department of uh, Human Services, also the CDC, and staying on top of the latest. You know, basically, um, we all took coronavirus very serious in March and April. Um, and then in May, we started to get a little bit of fatigue uh, and our early efforts worked really well. So the numbers started to drop and people started to relax a little bit. And one of the things you have to understand with coronavirus is that uh, when there's a change in behavior, about two to four weeks after that, or about two weeks after that, is when you start to see a change in caseload. So if we take it serious and we start to put in safety measures, about two weeks later, the number of cases drop. Or if we start to relax and start to go back to our old ways, about two weeks later, cases rise. Uh, and that's what we're seeing right now because we started to relax things in later May and then in June significantly. And right now cases are, are spiking again. Then about two to four weeks after you have a change in behavior, that's when hospitalizations start to change. We are seeing that now. And everybody is seeing the, the news that the governor has now put four counties on restrictions where we no longer have elective procedures because they are trying to protect the hospitals from getting overwhelmed. Houston is kind of the first major city in Texas that is seeing this uh, and their largest hospital is now at capacity in their ICU. And so we are seeing uh, Dallas uh, hospital starting to creep back up again. And the current trends are quite worrisome because, as I said, about two weeks um, from the cases going up, you start to see hospitalizations going up. And we're setting records right now for cases. That means in the next couple of weeks, hospitalizations are going to get even worse. And we're already hitting capacity. Um, now, I've seen a lot of people saying, but good news, um, even though cases are up, death counts are down. Now, there are some legitimate pieces of good news because we are doing a better job of treating it. We are now seeing some medication that is helping hospitalize patients. But the bad news is the deaths follow a change in behavior by about four to six weeks. Wow. So this current spike in cases and current spike in hospitalizations will start to show up as increased deaths in about two to four more weeks. So if we take a snapshot today, we say, great, cases are up, but deaths are down. But we have to remember deaths follow cases by about two to four weeks. So it is serious. A couple of numbers for you, and I want to read these to make sure I get these right. Um, on Wednesday, the U.S. had 36,880 new cases. Now, to put that in perspective, our previous peak came on April 12th when we had 31,992 cases. 
So we all remember how serious and bad things were in um, April, and that was heavily driven by New York and New Jersey, which were very populated states, and they kind of skewed everything. At the worst of the crisis then, we were just under 32,000. Yesterday or two days ago, we hit 36,000. Wow. Now, when I talk about the lag between cases and deaths, so our, our peak on cases was April 12th at 32,000. Our peak on deaths came nine days later on April 21st at 2,856 Americans dying in a single day. So recognize that when we are today hitting um, you know, 36, 37,000 new cases, that means in about nine to 10 days, we're gonna see our death count rise pretty dramatically. Wow. So it is serious. And we have to understand that we don't need to live in fear, but we need to respect this. And right now, too many people are not respecting this. And I can talk a little bit more about that in masks, but we need to be paying attention. So it's clear that we're going to need to take more precautions. And I want to tell you, I went to Canton. I love antique flea markets and, and you know, antique fairs. This was Canton, Texas, East Texas, about an hour away from Dallas. There was not a, a mask in sight. <laughs> this was the first weekend in June. So yeah. a lot has happened since then. So talk about now, what do we need to do for precautions? Let's just go over what are your thoughts and how can we, what can we do now? Okay, so great question. The two big things truly are keeping our distance and wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Now, early on, there was a lot of concern about surfaces and cleansing everything. And that's always good to do. Uh, by the way, that could make us have the best flu season ever if we remember those habits and mm -hmm. we clean our hands so regularly. But recognize too that there was some early guidance that has now turned out to be not as important. And some people will say, oh, the experts don't know what they're talking about. What you have to realize is this is a new virus. Mm -hmm. We've never seen a virus like this. And so early on, the experts were referring back to things they've seen in other viruses, and so they were throwing a lot of things out there. And you can't come back at them and say, gosh, they didn't know what they were doing. They were doing the best they could, mm -hmm. and now we have a couple months, we have a lot of data, and we now have a much better feel. And so the big thing that they are seeing is masks really make a difference. And countries where everybody has worn masks have dropped this dramatically. New Zealand, for example, has all but eliminated. America has not gotten on board with masks and unfortunately has almost turned this into a political issue to our own detriment. And we're putting a lot of people at risk. Now, people will say early on, they said, don't wear masks. And you have to understand, we have an incredible shortage of masks, and they were trying to protect them for healthcare workers. So uh, now that we're starting to catch up on masks, and we're still not there, uh, we need to all be wearing masks. Now, a little bit on masks. Um, this is my beloved Oklahoma State mask. This is a cloth mask. <laughs> and a lot of folks will say, well, cloth masks don't help. They do help. Are they as effective as a K95? No. Um, are they as effective as a respirator? No. But they do help. They will help me somewhat, but they'll help you quite a bit because if I have the virus, they will knock down some of the virus coming out. Now, this, these are both 95. Why is it called 95? Because it gets rid of 95% of the particulates coming in. Wow. And that's important to realize that this is a dosing issue. Um, you may get exposed to some virus without an issue, but if you get enough virus, that's where you get sick. That's why you need to limit the amount of time you're in front of people and talking, uh, and you need to make sure that you don't get a healthy dose. Well, where would you get a healthy dose? If I'm sick and I sneeze on you one time, I'm probably giving you enough sick. If I cough on you, there's a reasonable chance I've given you enough to be sick. That's why you should wear a mask because you never know when you'll get sneaks and cough on. Early on in the virus, I was wearing a mask at a grocery store. I was one of the only people. Mm -hmm. A person walked around the corner and sneezed right on me as they came around. 
I had no warning. I couldn't have socially distanced. He walked around and seized right on me. All it takes is one of those, and you could be sick. But going back to masks, this is a K95. This one protects me, and it protects you. Why does it protect you? Because none of my air, or very little of my air is going to come out. This one has a breather on it. That's going to let my bad air out. Okay, now this is more comfortable for me as it's a, it breathes a little bit more clearly, but it's gonna protect me, but it's not gonna protect you. This is what we use when we're taking care of a person who we know is sick because they've already got the virus. Mm -hmm. But if you're wearing one of these, you're not necessarily protecting others, you're just protecting yourself. If you're wearing one of these, you are protecting both yourself and, and others. And so that's really what we should be doing to be responsible. Um, so that's kind of your mini primer on math. But the other thing to realize is you need to limit your exposure and distance and masks are key. The virus will typically rest in the lungs and it takes some force to get it out. So if I'm talking to you, very little virus is coming out unless I'm a loud talker. Because if I'm a loud talker, I use more force with that air coming out. So if I am shouting, I'm putting a lot more out. That's why sporting events are a concern because at a sporting event, you're much more likely to cheer and shout. That's why singing is a concern because I'm, I'm expressing a lot more. I'm putting more of my lungs out there, okay? Um, that's why coughing and sneezing are issues because I'm doing a lot more of that. So if I'm sick and in my lungs, any activity where that's coming out is the key. And when we talk about six feet, you have to realize this was first done in, I believe, the 1930s. And they measured it. And if I'm talking to you, it's actually one meter. Um, so one meter is about three and a half feet. If I'm sneezing or coughing, it's two meters, which is about six and a half to seven feet. Okay? But rather than complicate that, we just say six feet. But your takeaways from that should be really a cough and a sneeze. You should be more than six feet away, or like seven feet. Uh, if you're just talking four feet, you're probably safe, but the key is time spent with the person and the ventilation. So if you're in an area that does not have tall ceilings, that doesn't have great ventilation, you're at much greater risk. And that's why being outdoors is so much safer because you've got great ventilation. And there have been very few transmissions outdoors with the exception being a place where people are shouting, you mm -hmm. know, sporting events, or people are crammed in. So don't hear from that, I'm fine to go to the beach, because if I'm at the beach and I'm right next to people, I can still get sick. Mm -hmm. If I'm at the beach and I've got some distance, I'm probably fine. So personally, I don't have too much concern being outside, but I'm also not getting next to people. And I also recognize that even if I'm outside, if somebody sees me on me or coughs on me or shouts at me, I can get enough of a day. So let's talk about restaurants. You know, one Texans love to eat out. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts, you know, on the social distancing in restaurants and what's going on out there? That's a great question. Um, and, you know, the reality is quicker we Texans take this serious and start to mask out, the quicker we can eliminate this and our friends in the restaurant business can reopen. Mm -hmm. I would be comfortable being in an outdoor area of a restaurant. I would be uncomfortable being in an indoor area unless there was true social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, quite frankly, indoor areas are of greater risk. But if you truly could distance people and they had a really good ventilation system, I will tell you, and we can talk a little bit more about this later, at Teresa's house, we have actually installed UV lighting in our air conditioning systems. Uh, because we're a senior care community, we have taken a lot of precautions. Our building is incredibly safe. Those are things restaurants can do as well, but the safest area would be to be out for on a patio and, and to have distance. I'd be nervous inside unless there was just real distance. Mm -hmm. What about flying? Just talking about that too. What are your thoughts on, because I flew, I was on a Southwest flight and they kept us two seats apart. 
Well, I was right. on another airline and it was crammed. It was filled. Every seat was taken. And so what are your thoughts on flying right now? Transportation, riding a bus or riding the subway. What are your thoughts on that? So great question. Um, and I have not studied airplanes extensively, but I have a good friend who is a pilot who shared with me that they actually replaced their air every 90 seconds. And that made sense because if they didn't have pretty darn good ventilation systems, we'd all catch colds after coming mm -hmm. off air. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. But even if that air is getting replaced every 90 seconds, if I'm sitting like next to somebody who has the virus and that person is coughing on me or sneezing on me, I could still get sick. Yeah, so definitely. I'd be comfortable if I were to seat away um, I would probably take the precaution of wearing a mask, but I, I think an airplane, a modern airplane is probably safer than a lot of others. I don't know if a bus is going to have that great of a ventilation mm -hmm. system or, or a subway, but I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I've not mm -hmm. had a chance to study that, but I, um, I would probably be okay flying if I wore a mask and I wasn't sitting next to somebody. The mask would be an abundance of precaution just because they are circulating that air so often mm -hmm. in fresh air. That's interesting. Thank you for the info. Okay, so now let's get to senior care. This is what we're good at, and this is what you are such an expert about. So quality care is n is more important than ever, and I know there are a lot of communities in Dallas-Fort Worth that have done an outstanding job in keeping their residents safe. And I just have to applaud the hard, hard work um, that's going on out there. And um, so let's talk about Teresa's house and how is Teresa's house the best option um, or a better option for if you do need to move your loved one, why Teresa's house? So Thank you for that, Theo. And, and let me just say that there are many senior care providers who have done an incredible job on this. Uh, there are groups that were studying this and bought their PPE well ahead of time and were stocked up. Uh, I know of entities that had their staff actually living on site. There are so many heroes in senior care right now, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and uh, there are a lot of entities that have done a great job. But as we know, there are some that have been hit hard. Uh, some of those were hit hard due to no fault of their own. Uh, some of those were hit hard because they didn't take precautions. And so you do need to choose a senior care community based on the expertise of ownership and leadership. You need to have people that know what they're doing because we are taking care of one of the most vulnerable populations. Now, I can tell you that Parisi House is a beautiful community. Uh, it is a fun community. It's a great place to live. But in addition to that, we took a lot of precautions that are not the norm. Uh, because Teresa, my business partner, is a registered nurse at uh, BSN, we built this to a healthcare grade that is uh, far and above what most communities are built to. We had seen the flu go through communities before uh, and had you know, devastating effects. And we also knew the importance of clean air, so we put a lot of uh, clean air systems into our building. We had no idea pandemic was coming, but you would have thought we built this uh, with coronavirus in mind. And as a matter of fact, Fred Worley, the retired lead architect in the state of Texas, has noted he thinks that the Teresa's house is probably the safest senior air building in the entire state. Wow. A couple of our advantages are, for starters, um, our, our houses are small. We have three houses on our campus. One is a 16-room memory care. We have two 12-room assisted livings. It's much easier to keep the coronavirus out of a small setting. Mm -hmm. Coronavirus is a number of people. The more people you're exposed to, the higher your risk. So the small settings just have an inherent advantage. In addition, in our model, we have a much higher expectation for our staff. All of our staff are either licensed, agreed, or certified. Much easier to get that group of staff to take this serious outside of work uh, and to wear masks and, and keep it out. But invariably, in time, the expectation is that we will get into everybody's home and probably into every senior care community. So then how do you keep it from going through a community where you can isolate it? Well, for starters, 
we have UV lighting in our actual ventilation systems. UV lighting is what is used in operating rooms to keep the air sterile. We actually have that built into our systems. We want to make sure that the flu and other things didn't create a problem. It kills 99.9% .9 of coronavirus as well. Wow. Every one of our equipment rooms has a separate heating and air conditioning system. We don't share any ductwork between rooms. So if we have a, a case, it's not going to spread from one room to another through the air, which is your dominant area. We actually even can block any air from going from room to room because of not only our separate ventilation system, but because some of our seals. Uh, we've done amazing things to make this uh, a, a very clean air safe place and uh, our protections are over the top, which is why the lead architects that he truly believes it's the safest in the state. And then incredibly importantly, we actually have nurses on site 24 seven and of course certified staff. And that's important because the senior that gets coronavirus oftentimes does not show up symptoms like you and I do. A younger person is much more likely to have a cough, to have a fever, to have the traditional symptom and a senior will often not. They will just be a little bit lethargic. And what's happening is that their oxygen levels are dropping. And unless you have a nurse there monitoring them, checking their oxygen saturation levels, you'll miss it until they crash and then it's often too late. So in our case, we actually have the equipment, the full boxes, the concentrators, and we have staff that know how to use it. So we've just got a, a medical overlay that is not the norm. Uh, and that's because we're career senior care people and we wanted to make this a very safe community. Well, and as a nurse, you know, I really do give that shout out to Teresa's house because I have been on call. I've been to a community for a patient in crisis and they can't find a nurse anywhere. And the nurse on call doesn't answer the phone. And it's really so sad for our seniors, you know, because we want to keep them safe. And when they move to a community, the family is depending on you to provide the very best care you can. And yeah. so, um, but th it's awesome that you're doing it. And so this is wonderful. I'm so impressed with Teresa's house. Um, so what else, what distinguishes Teresa's house from other communities beside the, the COVID um, great best practices? Uh, what, what else is, tell me something, some other special things about Teresa's house. Well, thank you, Joe. And by the way, I do have one last little tidbit on coronavirus. So don't let me forget to share that with you. But, okay. Um, Teresa's house is a best practice community. Teresa and I have both been doing this for more than 30 years. So we have 60 years between us. She actually uh, has sat on, she's been a board member of one of the national groups that gave the award to the most uh, innovative community. And so she has seen the most innovation. I have traveled the country, looked at many of the top communities. We picked the best elements of communities nationwide and we put them in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has a lot of great features that seniors will love. Our, our dementia care setting has an incredible state-of-the-art program that will cue a person through this disease process and help them retain a lot of dignity that otherwise wouldn't. But probably the best thing is that this is not a facility. This is a house, mm -hmm. kind of like a fraternity house, sorority house, but for seniors. So you walk in the door, you see an open kitchen, you see the staff cooking, you see the residents with the staff as we're cooking, we're eating together, we're having fun. We've got a beautiful sunroom, we've got the latest technology that we actually have uh, interactive TVs and um, iPads that have the background of every resident profile. So we know the person's hobbies, we know what they enjoy. Each staff member can sit down with them, find their favorite TV shows, find their favorite hobbies. We can actually do a, a Zoom call with up to eight family members on one of these. Uh, we can upload videos from families. But we have we have packed so much into this community to make it a really fun place to live. Uh, you just have to come see it. And then on top of that, it's beautiful. It's beautiful and very comfortable. And it really is a house. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's something at the end of the day, everybody would like to stay at home, but nobody's home is built for senior care. Mm -hmm. And being by yourself is not good for you. So we have a small group of seniors that really become great friends in a setting that is absolutely beautiful. And it's, uh, we're really proud of it. Thus far, uh, every, we're about a month from opening, 
every family member that has come out for it has indicated they're going to be moving in. So yeah. we're excited. And, uh, we hope folks come quick before we run out of out of road. I'm so happy for you, and I'm just I know you've had this vision for so long. And it's finally coming to pass, and we're so excited about Teresa's house. And I wouldn't be surprised if people duplicate what you do or try to, um, I mean, you've done the very best. So um, hats off to you, Godwin. Thank you so much for information. You have one more information you want to share about COVID. Yes, yes. So, and, and to your point, um, this, the, the idea for Teresa's house, Teresa is my business partner, actually sketched this out for me in 1997. Wow. Uh, and she said, as great of a job as we've done in the big settings, you can't personalize care in the big settings. You can't make a person what they want for breakfast. You can't make them what they, you, you can't personalize activities, programs, food, when you have many, many people to take care of. We've got to have a small setting where we can really focus on each senior. And uh, we, we put that dream on hold while we served the not-for-profit community in the 17 years that I led, led the Presbyterian system. Teresa was right there with me. And now we, we have a chance to do something really special for seniors. But my final takeaway um, for, um, for coronavirus is you, there are some promising things and it's important to watch and see what people do. And, and I'm watching some physician groups that have paid attention to the measles, mumps, to rubella, uh, titer shots and getting uh, your booster shot on that. What they have seen is that uh, communities that had a high degree of vaccination for this have had very low coronavirus cases. And they believe that, especially the rubella part, gives some protection that you otherwise wouldn't have. And so physician groups I know are immunizing their own families and encouraging others to get immunized. Uh, my family's going to get uh, our booster shots next week. But to put that in perspective, Madagascar had had an outbreak. And so they immunized everybody. And Madagascar has a population of 25 million. They have only had 16 deaths due to coronavirus. And they have wow. one of the highest percentages of vaccination for uh, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. Compare that to Belgium, that actually was very late in um, uh, doing measles, mumps, rubella. And so the older generation does not have it. And so Belgium has a population of 11.4 million. They have had 9,726 deaths from coronavirus. So think about that for a minute. Madagascar, 25 million people, 16 deaths. Belgium, 11.4 million people, 9,000 deaths. Wow. One has one of the highest rates of vaccination for uh, MMR. One has one of the lowest. And there are some theories, and this is early on, this is not yet fully peer reviewed, but that may be why children are having a better run with coronavirus because they've been more recently immunized. For these sort of things. By the way, shout out, uh, immunize your kids. But uh, I will tell you, this is something that is early on that's showing some promise. It has not yet been fully peer reviewed, so we certainly can't say a definite. But the physicians I know who are following this carefully are getting their families uh, booster shots. I'm getting my family's booster shots. And when you see a difference between a community like Madagascar and Belgium having that start, you say, you need to pay attention to that. So I think that's a good takeaway as well. Wow. But the most important things are masks and socially distancing. Mm -hmm. And if we truly care about our fellow citizens, if we truly care about our economy, if we truly care about America, this is a little thing you can do that makes a huge difference. And just the last thing, uh, um, Joe, because I know a lot of people feel very strongly about this, you and I are both people of and we know that it is the most vulnerable that are, are in most trouble with us, most are at risk. And the Bible says, what you did unto the least of these, you did unto me. Mm -hmm. If I wear this, I'm helping protect the least of me. Mm -hmm. And someday, um, you know, when we're going to answer how we behave, um, I want to say I, I did my part. And I, I think if all of us just wear our masks, we'll go a long way towards getting ourselves through this. And then the other thing we have to remember, None of us have experienced a pandemic. It was 1918, 1919, the last time any of us experienced a pandemic. Uh, we don't know how to act. 
and we have a chance to do this right. And you know, personally, and I'm all walking over here, this diploma uh, stands in my office here. This is my great aunt. And Aww. it's hard to see, 1917, this is her nursing license. Wow. She was a nurse in the great pandemic, this kind of flu epidemic. She went out and she took care of people and she actually died in the epidemic. She died of, wow. of Spanish flu. This is very serious. We've lost a lot of healthcare providers. We're gonna lose more if people don't take this serious. We need people to take this serious so we can get through this as a country. We do. Godwin, thank you for the awesome information, tips, advice. I wish you the very best of luck with Teresa's house. Um, and just thank you so much. Uh, you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.